everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Justin Reich. I'm the program director of the National Church of Leadership Center, which is here that we're in. And for those who are online, you can't see me, but I'm speaking from the side. So thank you for joining us both in person and online. I'm also executive director of the International Church Society. Um, so tonight, today, excuse me, marks 80 years of 80 years since the attack, surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. And in this event tonight, this discussion that we'll be starting here shortly, we would, we'll also be talking about Churchill's subsequent visit to the White House in December 1941, a few weeks later, so that he could visit with the Americans and the Americans and the, English, and the British would have their first military, joint military discussions. So December 7th, 1941, a date not a day, which our, our, our guest Colleen will get into, which President Roosevelt said would live in infamy, was 80 years ago today. So tonight's conversation will be moderated by journalist Robert Costa, who uh, is a national political reporter at the Washington Post, where he has worked since 2014. He's previously served as moderator and managing editor of Washington Week on PBS and as a political analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Notre Dame and a master's degree from the University of Cambridge. He'll be interviewing our two guests, Colleen Shogan and Robert Schmoll. Colleen Shogan is a senior vice president and director of the David and Rubenstein Center at the White House Historical Association. She previously worked in the United States Senate and as a senior executive at the Library of Congress. Colleen served as the vice chair of the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission and teaches at Georgetown University in the government department. Robert Schmoll became the inaugural Walter H. Annenberg Edmund P. Joyce Chair in American Studies in Journalism at the University of Notre Dame in 2006 and occupied the chair until July of 2018, when he became Chair Emeritus. He is the founder of Notre Dame's John W. Gallivan Program in Journalism, Ethics, and Democracy, and he was also the chair of the Department of American Studies four separate times during his 38 years on Notre Dame faculty. And I thank you all for being here. Please note that this conversation is being recorded and we will be available to watch it later on our YouTube page. And then lastly, I know our guests would love to take questions from you both in person and online. So if you're online, please use the Zoom Q&A function and I'll be monitoring the questions. And then when it comes to it later in the conversation, please raise your hand and I will, I will bring you a mic. So without further ado, Robert, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. Really appreciate you all being here. Those who are joining us in person, and the many people who are joining us online, we really appreciate you taking the time on this important day in history, 80 years ago today, the attack on Pearl Harbor. It's a pleasure to be back here at the National Churchill Library and Center at George Washington University. And it's really an honor to be here with Professor Shogun from Georgetown, Professor Schmuel from Notre Dame. Uh, as a journalist, I like to always have full disclosure. Professor Schmuel has been a mentor and friend to me for many years. Uh, so, but and Professor Shogun, I'm sure, is going to be a friend for many years to come if I do a decent job. So, thank you so much for both making the effort to be here. Uh, Professor Shogun, we'll begin with you. About 80 years on uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, what was it like through the eyes of Franklin Roosevelt? the President of the United States, as he processes the attack and then decides he has to say something to the country. Thanks so much, uh, Bob, and thanks, Justin, and Robert, it's an honor to be here today. So uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor happened around uh, a little bit before 8 a.m. local time uh, in Hawaii, and Franklin uh, Roosevelt was in uh, his study, not in the Oval Office. He was upstairs on the second floor of the White House in uh, the Oval uh, Room, which he used for his private study. It was around 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, and he was uh, having lunch with his advisor, Harry Hopkins, and a phone call came in from the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Frank Knox, and told FDR what had happened at Pearl Harbor. And really from that moment on, uh, some historians describe it as one of uh, Roosevelt's finest moments. He really directed the response and the war effort, the response to, to what had happened from uh, that private study in the second floor of the Oval Office, consulting, of course, with George Marshall, 
who is the Army Chief of Staff and the Secretary of State, Cordell Hull. And what I'm going to talk about today is really when uh, Roosevelt decided to talk about what happened, which publicly would happen the next day, December 8th, 1941. Uh, and it's a really fascinating story about this speech. When I dug into it, uh, I was uh, really, most of the time, presidential speeches have great stories. This one uh, did not disappoint. So uh, it, Roosevelt started working on the speech around 5 p.m. that day. Imagine all this happens. He only learns about it at 1.30. He's directing the response and the, and, um, the rescue efforts and, and learning what's happening. And at 5 p.m., uh, he starts to work on this speech. So I'm going to make five uh, uh, points about the speech, uh, and then I, we'll talk about more about Churchill and FDR's uh, time together in December of 1941 as we go on through the program. So the speech is very important historically. It's widely considered as one of the best speeches ever given by Franklin Roosevelt. And it's considered one of the best speeches ever given in American political history. It doesn't quite make the list of like the top 10 speeches of all time or things like that, but it's definitely when you start to look at the top 50 speeches, the top 100 speeches, that's when it starts to make an appearance. It's certainly what you would consider to be an exemplar of American political rhetoric. It's also noteworthy as a speech for both historians and for political scientists because it's the last time that a president goes to Congress and asks for a declaration of war. Uh, so in that sense, it's very important. Remember, the United States only declares war five more times in American history. That would be against Germany and Italy, and then Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania. Um, and so this is really the end of, of um, when you study war powers, the history of war powers, this is the end of the era of the president actually going to Congress to ask for this declaration of, of war. The second point I'll make about the speech is that it's brief. It's really short. It's under seven minutes long uh, if uh, you listen to it. Um, there were a number of people in Roosevelt's cabinet, including uh, the Secretary of State, who wanted FDR to give a much longer speech to Congress. Said, oh, you have to talk about the whole history of U.S.-Japanese relations, all the diplomatic efforts the United States had, had attempted in order to secure peace with Japan. And FDR listened to Hall and others. Uh, the night before, and he, he said, no, no, I know what I'm doing. Uh, this is going to be a brief speech. Uh, he thought it would be more dramatic. He thought it would have more effect. Um, so part of that speech that day was what people who study rhetoric would call the logos of the speech, which was the facts, uh, giving the Americans the facts. This is what happened uh, yesterday, uh, you know, giving people, they obviously heard radio reports and news reports, but giving them the authoritative facts from, from the President of the United States. But probably the more important components of the speech, or, or what you call the pathos of the speech, is really the emotional impact of the speech. You know, uh, trying to prepare, this is Roosevelt's first attempt, Roosevelt's first attempt to prepare Americans for the fact that they are going to be engaged in a long uh, war effort. Uh, so this is his first opportunity to basically prepare them for this and, you know, sell them on it because previously the United States had adopted a primarily isolationist viewpoint and stance. So the, the third point, I'll make some uh, comments about the draft of the speech. Um, there's six versions of the speech that exist at the FDR library. So only six versions uh, of the speech. And they were produced, obviously, in very rapid succession to each other. And as I said before, it's 5 p.m. in um, the uh, Oval Room in the second floor of the White House. And he calls his private secretary, and her name is Grace Tully, and says, uh, I need you to uh, sit down. I'm going to dictate a speech to you that I'm going to give tomorrow, hopefully, in front of Congress. And Grace Tully, in her memoirs, has described Roosevelt that as when he dictated the speech, uh, was very calm, very controlled, very sure of himself, didn't go back and say, no, strike that, you know, he just basically spoke uh, to her uh, and had really a, I guess you could say, a very clear presence of mind uh, about what he wanted to say, which once again, and is remarkable. It's only three and a half hours after he finds out what has happened, but he's able to take in everything that's, that has occurred that day, and he's able to sit down and understand what he wants to articulate to Congress, but also to the American people. His speechwriters were not intact. 
They were in New York City. I don't know what they were doing in New York City, but they were in town. Not a good day thought to be in Washington, D.C., but they were. Uh, so FDR was kind of on his own uh, in, in, in giving this speech. You know, he, uh, Harry Hopkins gave some uh, edits and some advice, but this was, this, you can really credit Roosevelt with penning this speech. So there were some important changes in the speech in those six drafts, and I'll just highlight a few of them. The most important important change is uh, what Justin had, had quoted before. Uh, it went from a date which will live in world history to a date which will live in infamy. Okay, and this is the first sentence of the speech, so it's really important because it captures your attention. Uh, so look up the word infamy, and you all kind of know what it means, but I want to, what is the actual definition of infamy? So look it up in a number of different online dictionaries. It means, in short, the, same, the common word is evil. That is what infamy means. That is the common description of infamy. So, so from the very beginning of the speech, you know, FDR is not pulling any punches. He wants to say this is an evil act, this is a dastardly act, and that sets the tone for the entire speech. So here's the full line. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by the naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The second important change to the speech is that the, um, he adds uh, into the second line of the speech this phrase, at the solicitation of Japan, so that the sentence reads, the United States was at peace with that nation and at the solicitation of Japan, was still in conversation with the government and its emperor looking towards the maintenance of peace in the, in the Pacific. So FDR wanted to emphasize to the American people and to Congress as well, also with an isolationist streak in it, that the United States uh, had been engaged with these diplomatic relationships with Japan at the solicitation with Japan. They were requesting these talks and we were complying with them, but while uh, they, we were doing that, they were also planning the attack on Pearl Harbor. And lastly, another important change, the last important change I'll mention is that Harry Hopkins advises him that FDR add, he didn't say how to do this, but he said you should add a reference to the deity at the end of the speech. So the line at the end becomes, with confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. And this is very common in uh, Roosevelt's rhetoric that we see later on um, related to the war. He often invokes God. He often says the cause of the United States, the same cause as God's. Uh, and we see this actually a lot throughout American political rhetoric. Um, the fourth point, uh, I'll talk a little bit about word selections. That first line of the speech, as Justin mentioned, is often misquoted. I, it's, it, I never really picked it up in my own brain until I became more sensitized to it. It's not uh, a day that will live in infamy. It is a date that will live in infamy. And I think that Ru, uh, Roosevelt did that. You know, he could have simply said a day that will live in infamy. It was a date because he wanted to capture once again this notion of history, that he wants to sear this in Americans' minds, that this is a critical date in American history and world history going forward. And the way that he's able to do this is by clearly saying date instead of day. And that also connotes this notion of history, uh, takes history out and it makes it infamy, but he's still able to keep that with the word date. Another thing when I read the speech, I noticed he says the word deliberately three times in rapid succession to each other. This is a short speech. And to use the word deliberately three times is deliberate. Um, FDR wanted to emphasize the attack was planned by Japan, and he knows he has to make that argument effectively to make sure that the declaration of war goes forward and also that he has the support of the American people going forward. The last thing I'll mention is that he has this unusual rhetorical device that he uses in the speech. Remember, the, uh, the Japan didn't just attack Pearl Harbor on December 7th, and here's what he says. Yesterday, the Japanese government also launched an attack against Malaya. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Last night, Japanese forces attacked the Philippine Islands. Last night, the Japanese attacked Wake Island. This morning, the Japanese attacked Midway Island. Now, he didn't have to list all these locations. He could have simply said that the Japanese attacked many installations in the Pacific in addition to Hawaii. But by listing those attacks, he made sure that Americans, that repetitive nature, right, 
uh, common trick used in rhetoric. We wanted to emphasize to everybody who is listening the extent of the attacks. Also, if you notice, some of those places that were attacked were not American installations. They were British installations. They were Dutch installations. And that's another subtle way of FDR arguing, hey, we're part of the Allies now. America is in with Britain, right? This is the first indication that America will start, the United States will start to think of itself as part of the Allied force. So the last point I'll make, what was the impact of the speech? Well, amazing, 81% of American homes listened to that speech uh, when it was on the radio, which is remarkable. 40 minutes later, Congress declares war on Japan. So that doesn't take uh, very long. Um, and one of the things that FDR does in, in the speech is that he, you know, he tells everybody what, what has happened and, and why it's happened. And then he argues that the only response that is feasible, the only outcome that can possibly happen is absolute victory. It means that the United States, as he says, will make very certain that this form of treachery will never endanger us again. So there's not going to be any halfway effort here. We're not just going into war and resolving what happened in Oahu. This is going to be a full-scale effort. And remember, using the word infamy, this is going to be a battle. And this is FDR laying it out. This is going to be a battle between good and evil. And this is, you know, and uh, the, the evil doers are clearly identified. This will affect American um, political rhetoric um, for decades to come all throughout the Cold War uh, with great success. Uh, this will be this type of, of rhetoric between good and evil, the state actors that are responsible. We'll see this over and over again uh, and, and really very clearly exemplar of this in the Pearl Harbor speech. So in conclusion, I would say that, you know, um, we remember the December 8, 1941 speech because of FDR's eloquence. We remember the memorable lines, right, in the speech. But I think, you know, quite frankly, I think what FDR did the best and what he should be remembered for was that he was realistic in the speech and he was frank in the speech. He never sugarcoated the situation. He was explicit about the sacrifice that would be required. And he, he was really brutally honest in a very forceful way. He was optimistic, but he was brutally honest. And I think that when we think about our political leaders and our presidents today, uh, they could really, you know, they could study this speech and think about it as, as an example because of what FDR did in that speech. And then the last point um, I'll make is um, I thought a lot about this speech and um, the subsequent speeches that FDR and Churchill made in the coming month. And I really think, what were they trying to achieve? in these series of speeches, besides communicating information uh, about what was happening and what would be required to them. And I think that the clear purpose that both FDR and Churchill dealt with in this time was fear. This is what they had to deal with. Um, and they both knew intimately that fear was, was dangerous. And why is fear so dangerous? Because it's paralyzing, it's debilitating. When you're in awe of something or you fear something, uh, you're inclined towards inaction and you're stymied into inaction. And so FDR and Churchill knew that fear could be debilitating. And I think this is a perfect thing to end with because uh, it has a lot of relevance, I think, for us today related to the pandemic. You know, fear causes us to be like a deer caught in headlights and it needs to be surmounted if problems are going to be dealt with effectively. And I think we see this in this series of speeches that we see from FDR beginning December 9th, uh, December 8th, 1941, and going forward into those next critical weeks that Churchill and FDR spend together. Thank you so much, Professor Shogun. Uh, Professor Schmill, you're working on a book about Prime Minister Churchill. And in some ways, President Roosevelt's speech was explicit, was honest, but as Professor Shogun said, it was subtle in its, its nod toward the United Kingdom, for the British effort. What does the prime minister hear and see uh, from the American response to Pearl Harbor? And why does he decide to make this trek across the Atlantic to visit President Roosevelt? Uh, thank you, and it's great to be here. 
I'll pick up on the one word, fear. He had no fear. Winston Churchill, from really the beginning of the war, wanted the United States to be involved. And I suspect everyone here and online would remember the great speech, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds. How does that speech end? It ends by saying our empire will carry on the struggle until in God's good time, in God's good time, the new world with all of its power and might steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. He said that in June of 1940. He'd just become the, uh, the prime minister. And almost all of his speeches after that called on America. Please get involved. Help us. Give us the tools. We'll finish the job, he says at one point. And Churchill, fearless. Roosevelt, fearless. Met off Newfoundland in August of 1941, met about the war, met about uh, the way that they could cope with the world. And out of that came the Atlantic Charter. And uh, one of the decisions that was made in August of 1941 was that the countries would focus on Hitlerism on Germany. So the Germany first psychology begins. And on December the 8th, the same day as the speech, Winston Churchill says, I am going to America. And Franklin Roosevelt says, no, geez, we're busy over here. Um, we can't handle, uh, you know, a visit. I am coming. And on December the 10th, Franklin Roosevelt sends him a telegram and says, we are overjoyed that you're coming and you'll stay in the White House with us. And what you see is a, a very interesting figure. He took 25 trips abroad during the Second World War. Now, but just think about it. Given all of the peril, given all of the, uh, the U-boats and the, the shooting down of airplanes, because he, he traveled in both modes, uh, shall we say, coming over here in December of 41, he is on a ship uh, going home. Uh, he goes in an airplane, so that um, you have this figure who was always the risk taker, the daredevil. And Franklin Roosevelt, quite frankly, didn't do much traveling. He did. He went to you know, North Africa. He went to Tehran. He went to Yalta. Never, interestingly enough, never went to Britain. Um, Churchill always came here, here, five different um, occasions during the, uh, the Second World War. Stalin was afraid to leave Moscow, uh, only went to uh, Tehran and to uh, Yalta, uh, and it was on his terms, uh, each of those. Um, so that uh, Churchill is a man of action and without fear. And he comes over here, and what's interesting about the visit, and the visit was a long one, 24 days, um, is that it begins in such a public way. He arrives on the 22nd of December. It is not announced to the world, to America or back in Britain or anywhere else until he is inside the gates of the White House. He is there on the 23rd 
What happens? The two of them give a press conference. And Winston Churchill is built somewhat like me, shall I say, short, round. Uh, and he could sense that the reporters in the back couldn't see. So he puts a chair up on the desk and climbs up to give his responses to their questions. Always a show. With cigar, without cigar, what have you. That's the 23rd. The 24th, the public Christmas tree lighting, where he speaks and Franklin Roosevelt speaks. And it was the first time people in America heard him on their soil, heard his voice from the White House, Winston Churchill. 25th, the two leaders go to church together. Uh, they're photographed at church on Christmas Day. On the 26th, he delivers an address to a joint session of Congress. Each of those times, you have him making an even greater impact on the American public. How great was that impact? I brought some uh, front pages, which I'll hold up in a moment. Um, but one of the intriguing items that I found up at the uh, Roosevelt Library is two sets of twins, one in Louisiana, one in Alabama, were named Winston and Frank. He got so much mail that uh, the people in the White House didn't know quite what to uh, quite what to do with it. He, this is a envelope that was in the papers of one of his secretaries and it's available over at the Churchill Archives. And it's a special delivery envelope. And in 1942, in January, on January 2nd, you paid all of 15 cents for a special delivery letter delivered to the White House. And who was the recipient? Churchill the Magnificent, <laughs> the White House, Washington, D.C. And that was all. That was enough uh, for people to see. Um, it is estimated that people at the White House incinerated about 5,000 cigars that arrived during the course of his visit. Uh, again, there, there was fear, could be poison in them or whatever. Um, so they just burned them. I mean, you could imagine how a cigar smoker felt um, seeing that go up in smoke. Um, but I think what you say is that um, he comes over here, makes a big splash, um, becomes extraordinarily uh, well known, even more than uh, it was uh, he was at that uh, particular time. But the public phase ends, and he does run up to um, Canada and gives a famous speech. I suspect most of you here and in the uh, viewing audience know that famous picture of Churchill, you know, looking like that right into the camera. Uh, Karsh of Ottawa. And that picture was taken right after he had left Washington to go up to Canada to address the Canadian Parliament. What, why did Churchill look that way uh, for the photograph is because Karsh demanded that he remove the cigar from his hand. And he was not happy to have that happen, which is recorded for posterity's um, sake. 
But the point is, he comes back and they continue to have meetings. And the meetings are important. It is not only a matter of Churchill getting to know Franklin Roosevelt uh, better, um, but all of the staff are working together and creating the Allied cause, uh, the combined chiefs of staff, the combined resources. All of that is taking place during this uh, very important uh, visit. And um, we talked about the, uh, the importance of the, um, of the Roosevelt speech. Let me just, uh, you don't mind. Um, this was in the Observer, um, UK newspaper. Uh, on December the 28th of 1941, and his speech, of course, was the 26th of December. Quote, Mr. Churchill made history on Friday by addressing Congress. What he said will rank in history with the famous speech made by Lincoln on the field of Gettysburg some 70 years ago. Lincoln's speech defined democracy. Churchill symbolized the Anglo-American unity that now defends it, so that after victory, the two nations, for the good of all, will walk together in majesty, in justice, and in peace, which were the last words of Churchill's speech to Congress on the 27th. Professor Schmiel, just a quick follow-up. Uh, are there any fun stories about Churchill and Roosevelt together inside the White House? Um, I knew you, you'd want levity rather than real substance. I am a journalist. I know. I know. That's, that's one of your virtues. Two, uh, two academics here. I'm a journalist. The, uh, I suspect it's, it's well known. Um, how Franklin Roosevelt delivered his decision as to what they would call the Allies. At one point, they were calling them the Associated Powers. And it doesn't have much of a ring or buzz to it. And during the night, Franklin Roosevelt thought and thought and came up with United Nations. And he loved it. He loved it. And quite frankly, it is the foundation of the United Nations that we have today and the naming of it. Well, he gets excited and he's in his wheelchair and goes to the door where Winston Churchill is staying and knocks and he hears come in and he, he goes in and he sees that Winston Churchill has just gotten out of his bath <clears throat> and um, Roosevelt's a little bit knocked, you know, off kilter uh, to, oh, you know, oh, and Churchill it is said, said the prime minister has nothing to conceal to the president of the United States. Conceal is one word, hide is another. It's often told. But I will share with you this evening on this occasion, another story, similar subject. And it is found in a manuscript privately published. I found it over in Cambridge in a college 
the librarian and said, you're the first person who's ever asked to see this. And I said, I probably am. And it was written by the man who was the keeper of the map room. And the map room is very important to Churchill to follow the, the troops and the ships and, and all of this. His name was Vivian Cox. And he is standing outside the map room on January 13, 1942. And uh, he sees Franklin Roosevelt and Wendell Wilkie coming down the hallway. Wendell Wilkie runs against FDR in 1940. So you have the president and the defeated Republican candidate walking down the hall towards you. And Roosevelt inquired whether Winston Churchill had arisen yet. And Churchill often referred to himself as a tardy riser. He would sleep in, usually. Cox um, replied he didn't think that he was awake but he would take the two to the prime minister's suite. I will quote now just two paragraphs. I went ahead, knocked on the bedroom door, heard the cry of come in, opened the door wide to admit the wheelchair and ushered the visitors into the bedroom. There, standing in the middle of the floor, naked, and unashamed, and looking for all the world like a Botticelli cherub was Mr. Churchill, with his valet behind him looking for some elusive article of clothing. The prime minister turned the door, and his face lit up. How very good to see you. He beamed with outstretched arms. Then we get to the, we get to the kicker. Keep this PG-13. <laughs> it will be. I, I would, I'm in hallowed academic halls. Pray, excuse my state of nature. But I dare say you are. That ends the Churchill quote. And the rest of the greeting was lost behind the door, which I closed swiftly, looking east and west to assure myself that there had been no unauthorized beholders of this informal scene. One of the uh, White House butlers in writing about Churchill's visit, and it's very interesting to read the butler's memoirs, uh, said that his servants were always sort of uneasy with Churchill because if he wasn't in his room, if he was wearing his jumpsuit, you know, the jumpsuit, the siren suit, he could jump into it, zip it all the way up, which he wore in the White House uh, most of the time. He was either in his jumpsuit or nothing at all. And the servants never knew quite what to expect when they delivered his brandy and other um, adult beverages during his time there. So that you, you get stories like this, Eleanor not happy, a fun fact that, um, and a small irony of American history, um, on that first visit, Eleanor, sees the prime minister stalking the halls around two or three in the morning and says that he's on his way to talk to Franklin. And she says, no, no, he's, he's, he's sleeping. And Eleanor goes to Franklin shortly thereafter and says, could the government buy Blair House? as a residence for visiting uh, leaders. And in 1942, 
the United States government bought warehouse. But the end of the story is that Winston Churchill never stayed in Blair House. He returns in June of 1942. He comes back in May of 43. He's back in September of 43. And when uh, Dwight Eisenhower is president, he comes back for a visit because he, of course, has returned as prime minister during that early part of the Eisenhower years. And the final visit of Winston Churchill and Eisenhower made him stay with him at the White House was in 1959. And on that occasion, Eisenhower puts Churchill in his helicopter to fly over to his farm at Gettysburg. And how did those two war leaders, um, what did they talk about during that particular trip? Churchill pointed out the battlefield and where all of the attacks and the combat occurred because he had studied the American Civil War. So that Blair House never had a visit from, uh, from Winston Churchill, even though Eleanor Roosevelt certainly wanted that. I just took a drive up, coincidentally, to Gettysburg, and I stopped by the Eisenhower home, and you can still see the cars, the old cars that Churchill, and the golf cart-type cars that Churchill and Eisenhower rode around on that Gettysburg property. We have a few minutes left before we get to questions, just a few, about five minutes left. Uh, Professor Shogun, if you could uh, maybe just tell us a quick story about the Christmas tree lighting in December of 1941, and then dovetail into some concluding remarks before we get to Q&A. About this central question, we've heard so much about the speech, and so much about the visit, but what did this all mean for the war? How did it shape the war, or what was the consequence of this activity, this important critical moment in December 1941? In fact, we have a few minutes, about five minutes left. Sure. Um, so the, the, there's an interesting story about the Christmas tree lighting on December 24th. Uh, the Christmas tree lighting had previously taken place uh, since Calvin Coolidge started the tradition uh, on the ellipse as it takes place uh, just last week here in Washington, D.C. But for and this is before the United States got into uh, the war, before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Franklin Roosevelt, did, he didn't, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but he did not like the ellipse as the location for the Christmas tree lighting. He said, you know, we should have these Christmas tree lights. They should be on White House grounds, White House proper grounds within the fence. We should invite people in. They should be able to uh, enjoy the, the lighting, uh, and it should be on, on White House property. So, um, uh, in June of 1941, so well before December, he uh, directs that the Christmas tree lighting will be on the South Lawn. And uh, as a result, they move two very large uh, uh, trees from the ellipse area and move them over to the edge of the South Lawn on the White House, about 100 feet from the edge of the fence of the South Lawn, and about 1,000 feet uh, from uh, the portico of the White House. And those two trees are, uh, are planted so that they'll be ready for the Christmas tree lighting. And just as Robert says, they have, you know, of course, Churchill shows up and he speaks at the Christmas tree lighting. Uh, FDR speaks, they talk about why it's important to actually celebrate the holidays and celebrate, celebrate Christmas this year. Uh, it's not something that we should just indulge. This actually separates us from the people we'll be fighting against. They make that point. Let the children have their fun. They like the Christmas tree. Uh, but interestingly enough, the fun fact is that that tree is still actually on um, the south lawn of the White House, uh, still 100 feet away from uh, the fence. And what they do today is it's not lit for Christmas. Like I said, the, the Christmas tree lighting is now moved uh, to the ellipse and did so during the Eisenhower era. Um, but they light that uh, tree. It's so tall. 
They light it when uh, Marine One comes in uh, to land on the South Lawn because they put a little red light on it because it helps guide the pilot in to know that that's the edge of, because it's only 100 feet from the fence on the South Lawn. It helps guide the pilot if it's you know twilight or nighttime landing on the South Lawn. So that tree still serves a purpose. Um, so to the larger question, I mean, uh, you know, it's really hard, I think, for I think for political scientists and historians to say this was the definitive moment that made the war. This was the definitive month of the war, December 1941. There's a lot of people that make arguments for different segments, uh, different points of time in the war. I think it's very safe to say, though, that this is a critical decision point in the war. Uh, with the meeting of Roosevelt and Churchill. Because first, of course, as, as Robert said, Churchill decides to come over, FDR welcomes him. But then in those, uh, in, in those weeks that they spend together, uh, they get along, you know, really quite well. I mean, uh, you know, it, not to even, not to, you know, make it sound, uh, you know, all hunky-dory, they do get along really well. And I think the most important thing is what, what happens there's some, you know, we were talking about this uh, when we were sitting uh, backstage, you know, did in particular FDR ever have any friends? Was, you know, he was a little bit of a uh, withdrawn character. Some people maybe described him as, 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 as cold, uh, not as heartwarming as you would think, some people might think he was. Um, but certainly at least in that moment in time, you really have to, you really get the sense that there's this kinship and friendship that forms between FDR and uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And why is it so remarkable? It's not just, I don't think, I've concluded it's not just a friendship based upon um, uh, uh, necessity, based upon need. Uh, it's not just a friendship based upon pleasure. These are the two uh, uh, lower categories of friendship that are identified by Aristotle in, in the ethics, right? But it's truly, it's a relationship and friendship, at least at that point in time, in December 1941, it may change over the course of the war, but it's really a friendship that's based upon shared principles. They agree, they may disagree some, somewhat on some of the strategy in the war or what, what should happen next, but they really agree about the main principles of what they're fighting for and the fact that once again, it has to be, there's no other outcome besides absolute victory. That has to, it's not halfway, it has to be absolute victory. That is absolutely essential. Uh, and, and the Germany is at the root of, of all of this. And they agree on those first principles. And that really sets in motion what happens subsequently for the next, you know, three and a half to four years. Professor Schnell, any concluding brief thoughts before we get to Q&A on the same theme? Uh, the one thing I would say that to me is so interesting about Churchill is that he is uh, trying to formulate strategy. He is trying to um, create this common cause among the, uh, the allies. And yet this is a man who then goes to his room in the White House and writes a speech for the Christmas tree lighting himself. He, on December the 25th, on Christmas Day, excuses himself from the movie that the people are watching and says, I have my homework to do. And he goes up and writes his speech to be delivered in Congress on the 26th. He goes to Canada and writes a speech to deliver to the Canadian Parliament. I mean, he is doing all of this at the same time. And um, that became a pattern for him when he came to the United States. He delivered another address to Congress uh, in 43. Um, and so you have this person who is calling the shots, who is leading, who is meeting and conferring with Roosevelt um, all hours of the day and night. Um, and yet he's going back and uh, writing his copy, writing his speeches, 
so that he can uh, uh, communicate not only to his people back in uh, Great Britain, but certainly for the people in this country and around the world. And one, and one quick personal note, uh, about 80 years ago, Speaker Nancy Pelosi was born. History is never that far away from all of us. And a few years ago, I was at the Speaker's office at the Capitol, and she pulled me aside. And she knew I had studied Churchill at Cambridge. And she said, I want to show you something. She shows me a picture of Churchill addressing Congress in December of 1941. And she points to a man with dark hair up in the crowd, and she said, that was my father. Her father uh, was in the House of Representatives when Churchill spoke. History is never really that far away, at least World War II. Um, so now we'll turn to questions. We'll first go to, uh, if anyone in the room has a question, then we'll take some questions from online. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, if you could use the microphone so the online audience could hear, that'd be great. I'm just wondering whether uh, you believe Churchill would have convinced Roosevelt to join war effort? If we hadn't been attacked? It's an excellent question. And the answer is that uh, Franklin Roosevelt never got out ahead of public opinion. And um, Churchill sails over to Newfoundland in August of 41 with the hope that he will be able to talk him into it at that point. Franklin Roosevelt wouldn't do it. Um, and um, you remember that when he was running for a third term, which was enormously controversial in, in 1940, he went around saying, you know, we are not going to involve our boys in a foreign war. And isolationism was very prevalent in the United States. And remember, those were the days when, um, when Lindbergh was very powerful in terms of his own influence. And so uh, I do not think that uh, Churchill, even with his persuasive power, um, could have brought Franklin Roosevelt in short of what happened 80 years ago today. Um, what is interesting and worth thinking about is that the attack occurs in the Pacific from Japan. And yet, it was a Germany first policy. I think that was a motivation, a strong motivational factor to bring Churchill over. He wanted the United States to be involved in Europe as much as the Pacific. Uh, and so when he hears that news, um, it's a deliverance for him. It opens the door and then he is able to uh, get involved and talk through everything. It's a great question. Anyone else here in the room have a question? Uh, Justin, will you need one from online? Yes, this is for uh, Colleen as a White House historian. You say there are only six drafts of FDR's speech. Is that for when it comes to when it comes to presidential speeches, is that not many? Well, certainly it's compared to contemporary times. No, it's, that's not many. Uh, I wouldn't even venture to, to guess how many drafts, for example, uh, a State of the Union address goes through or, or a planned speech. Of course, there was a very abbreviated time frame. You know, FDR is just working from 5 p.m. on December 7th, and he delivers the speech on December 8th at 12.30 p.m. on Capitol Hill. So there's not that much time to go through too many iterations of it. Um, even in those, but I think the more remarkable thing, six drafts, but there's really not that every draft is just a few minor changes. It's not like the entire speech is rewritten from 5 p.m. on December 7th. It's that much different than the speech that he actually gives on December 8th at 1230. There's a few of these important word changes which make the speech better, but the structure of the speech, 
certainly the brevity of the speech, uh, all of that remained the same, which is really remarkable that he's able to dictate that, I think, to Grace Tully, and most of it remains. Uh, Professor Shogun, if I wanted to go look at a copy of that speech in a museum, where would I go? Yeah, the FDR uh, uh, library has a, a version of the speech online. I looked at a few of them uh, when I was writing my remarks. You can bring them up, you can see uh, Hopkins handwriting, you know, deity right there, and, and you can see some of FDR's edits and crossouts. So uh, they have it, but what they do not have, which is history mystery, uh, what they do not have is the actual copy of the speech uh, that he used to give, that he, that he used when he gave the address to Congress. Uh, that has been missing since December 8, uh, 1941. Um, Roosevelt's eldest son, James, uh, accompanied him to Capitol Hill to uh, the chamber when he gave the speech and actually sits you know, near him, helps him get down to the aisle, to the dais, and then sits near him uh, during the speech. And after uh, FDR finished, um, James took the speech, which FDR gave the speeches in like a three ring binder, and they were always uh, triple spaced. Uh, uh, James took the speech, they returned to the White House, and James apparently placed it on a coat rack, I believe in, in the entrance hall, uh, or, or, you know, right next to the, uh, the coat rack in the entrance hall, and the speech was, was never seen again. Nobody knows where it is. They thought uh, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I, I think a Senate archivist thought that uh, he had found it. And big, you know, uh, excitement. I found the speech. It was not the speech because it wasn't triple space and it wasn't hole punch. So the archives quickly came and looked at it, and the archives said, "No, that's not the speech that Roosevelt used to give this to give before Congress." So we don't know what that physical copy is. A stolen speech. It sounds like the premise for a Nicholas Cage national treasure movie. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, Justin. Yeah, this is one more question. This is actually for the moderator. Um, Sorry, uh, Mr. Costa does master's thesis in Cambridge on Churchill. Um, was Mr. Costa surprised to learn in his studies? What was Mr. Costa surprised to learn in his studies about Churchill that still guides his reporting today? Well, I, I would like you both to answer this. These yeah, two, I'll, I'll, these two esteemed professors. I mean, such students of the presidency. Uh, as an amateur student of the presidency. I was always surprised about how Churchill had these relationships in the United States going back before the war, long before the war, coming to give speeches in the 20s and the 30s. And that struck me as a young student that maybe geopolitics and diplomacy is not always about the transactional bargains of the moment and the, the pure state and state uh, relationships, but sometimes about the personal. And I read this book called Martin Gilbert's uh, Churchill in America that really moved me in my early 20s that Churchill's relationships in the United States mattered. Uh, and he has this relationship with Roosevelt that comes out of these foundational relationships in the economic sphere, the political sphere. But uh, just to, to put a pin in this, this wonderful discussion, uh, what surprised you both uh, in a brief summary uh, as you look at December 1941 or what intrigues you perhaps to this day is a better question. Professor Schmiel and Professor Schroeder. Let me just follow up, uh, Bob, and say that the primary reason why Winston Churchill uh, came to the United States was, if you'll forgive me, to make money. Early on, not in 41. Oh, absolutely not. But but your point about cultivating Americans. And he was a speech maker. He was a speech Often. maker. He was, uh, he was the highest paid journalist in Britain during the 19 uh, teens and then into the, even into the uh, 30s. And if you do a little um, study of it, his six volumes on the Second World War each volume was published in the United States of America before it was published in Great Britain because of the ability to make more on, uh, on royalties. So that this intersection of Churchill and America, it's, it's interesting. Now, to 1941. 1941, 
was the first trip that Winston Churchill took to America in a decade. And his previous trip, 1931, was for a lecture tour. And he is in New York City, and he gets out of a cab, and he is British, and he looked the wrong way, and was almost killed in this accident. And it takes him months to, uh, to recover from it. So the, the trip to America in 41 is his first one since, uh, since then. But I think more than anything, and to put a pin in it, as you would say, um, the whole notion of the special relationship that we continue to hear about today, that really begins with the first trips over to meet with Franklin Roosevelt. The phrase comes into existence in um, the sort of middle of the 40s, and he embraces that along with the English-speaking peoples, another one of his famous phrases. But if you're looking for foundational importance, the special relationship comes during this 41-42 trip, as does the United Nations from Franklin Roosevelt. Final thoughts, Professor Shogun? Yeah, I would just say, I mean, I was just astounded by uh, both what I read about FDR and also Churchill in, the, in this time period, just the calmness and the clarity that they both had of what needed to be done. I mean, can you imagine the pressure? Can you imagine taking in all this information certainly on December 7th, but then also all the days that follow as things are happening very quickly and, and declarations of war are happening back and forth and, and, and troops are mobilizing. Uh, and there's, in, in not just Grace Tully describes FDR this way, there's numerous descriptions like Eleanor describes uh, FDR these days as, as just having this absolute serenity and calmness about him uh, and I think this stems once again from the fact that when Churchill arrives, they may disagree on some of the details, and they will certainly down the road, but this agreement on first principles and what is most important about the war effort, they are in agreement with each other on. And that must have been maybe the, the or, part of the origin of their, of their calmness and resoluteness because they were no longer, no longer in it alone they were in it together. Uh, and it's, a, it's just a really heartwarming story. I don't know of another relationship like that between an American president and a foreign leader. I tried to think of, of some examples, um, uh, you know, and I, I really couldn't come up with one quite like what we see between Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, particularly at that moment in time. Before we go, I would just urge you all here in the audience in person at George Washington University and those joining us online to follow the work of these two first-rate professors, Professor Shogun at Georgetown University, written so many essays, books, The Moral Rhetoric of American Presidents, a student of the presidency, a protector of the, of the history of the presidency, someone who's an active White House historian working with the Historical Association, someone who's in the arena, as they say, uh, in, in really thinking and writing and teaching the American presidency and history. And Professor Schnull, the University of Notre Dame, the author of a, a really great new book about the presidency called The Glory and the Burden. What a phrase about the presidency, isn't it? The Glory and the Burden. And now working on a book on Churchill, we'll be looking for that uh, when it comes out and the new edition of The Glory and the Burden next year. Uh, but a round of applause for these two professors for exciting proceedings. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you so much to Justin Reich and the National Churchill Library and Center for, for joining us on this important day. December 7th, a date, not a day, that will live in infamy. But this, this particular day will hopefully live on uh, with good memory. Thank you all for joining us.